I am Rabbi Shaul Praver. You're watching Rabbi Rocks. A picture is worth a thousand words. Pictures used in the media have the ability to invoke deep emotions in the viewer. But it's in very important that these thousand words are truthful words. Take this picture, for example. It's a very powerful image you're looking at. But what are we seeing? What are the who, what, where, when, why, and how? They're missing. It's just a picture. Who is the policeman? Who is the man bleeding? What is the policeman yelling? Where did this take place? When did it take place? Why did it take place? And how did it take place? In it of itself, seeing is not believing. We have to know what we're seeing. Here is how several news organizations in the Middle East filled in the blanks to provide meaning to what you're looking at right now. You see a grimacing Israeli policeman holding a baton raised, standing over a young man that's brutally bloodied. A caption reads, you don't see it there, but it appeared in most of the newspapers where it was presented, quote, an Israeli policeman in a Palestinian on the Temple Mount. The story that emerged from that was the Palestinians were rioting as a result of Ariel Sharon's visit to the Temple Mount in 2000. The policeman is a riot policeman and has just clubbed one of the protesters over the head with his baton. As such, the mood of the scene would have him shouting, Who's next? Who else wants it over the head like this? The dynamic created the tough, brutal Israeli versus the weak Palestinian protester. It may look that way, and it seems that some would want to assume that it's that way. However, you will now learn that the facts are completely different. Here it is. The bloody man in the picture was not Palestinian at all, and the angry Israeli policeman did not beat him. The bloody man was actually an American Jewish student named Tuvia Grossman, who had been assaulted along with two other American friends while riding in a Jerusalem taxi cab. Arabs had stoned the cab and its occupants, dragging Tuvia out, of the, out to beat and stab him. Tuvia broke free from his assailants, and though he had lost his glasses and could not see well, he fled to the closest Israeli policeman that he could find. The policeman raised his baton and yelled at the assailants and put on a show of strength to protect Tuvia and his friends from further assaults by the attackers. At that point, a photographer snapped the shot. Now I ask you, how do you feel about the policeman now? How do you feel about the bloody man? And lastly, how do you feel about the news organization that reported the story? Yes, a picture is worth a thousand words. But we must make sure that the words that the picture is presenting are truthful words. Then we can say with confidence, seeing is believing. You're watching Rabbi Rock. Today we have the great pleasure of having with us New York Regional Director of Camera, Danielle Rothman. And it's such a pleasure to have her here with us to tell us about the work that Camera is doing. Shalom. Thank it's great you for to having have you me. Shalom. Uh, please tell us the history and the purpose of CAMERA. CAMERA stands for Committee for Accuracy in Middle East Reporting in America. CAMERA was founded in 1982 as a grassroots response to the Israeli invasion of Lebanon. Um, 
Its purpose was as a media monitoring and research organization, and in the past 24 years of its existence, it's greatly expanded its reporting, coverage, tools, and research mm -hmm. capabilities and membership. We now have over 55,000 members in 49 states and a very active letter writing team of over 7,000. Wow. We have offices in Boston, New York, San Francisco, Israel, um, and we're expanding rapidly. Our offices were headquartered in Boston under the leadership of the wonderful Andrea Levin. Fabulous. Do you have a uh, mission statement to read for us? Yes, camera, um, camera's mission is to promote accurate and balanced coverage, media coverage of Israel and the Middle East and to foster rigorous reporting while educating news consumers about the Middle East and the role of the media. Because public opinion ultimately shapes public policy, um, distorted news coverage that misleads the public can be detrimental to sound policy making. I also just want to point out cameras and non um, political organizations, so we take no official position with regard to any ultra ultimate solutions uh, of the Ara to the Arab-Israeli conflict. You just want to make sure that the news is correct. Exactly. It's the facts, like uh, we cited before an example in the beginning. Exactly. All right. Tell us about the accomplishments that uh, CAMERA has uh, contributed so far. Well, aside from our um, specific corrections we get in the media almost every day, as well as our very public letter writing campaign, I'd say our biglish, biggest accomplishment is growing CAMERA into a massive team of over 55,000 members and, as I said, 7,000 letter writers who are actively write to the media all of the time, as well as our staff, which is in constant contact with the media every day, forming relationships with journalists, reporters, media outlets, um, making sure that these outlets stay educated with regard to the issue of Israel. And for that reason, these media outlets, again, they know the facts about Israel and they're less likely to accept um, distorted stories or mm -hmm. inflammatory stories about Israel without checking the facts first. They know that they're being watched and that people expect them to be uh, reporting factual information. Yes, and these media outlets don't like to make errors. It's embarrassing yeah, sure. to them. Okay. Uh, what are some of the trends in the media? What, what are the uh, biases that you notice and uh, from your experience working for camera? Well, I'd say one of the biggest problems is Europe. The European media um, when it comes with regard to Israel is extremely biased compared to the media in the U.S. Um, we've been educating reporters and media outlets in um, the U.S. for a while, but we've only recently started to work on the issue of the very large issue of Europe. I think the main problem is the culture of Europe is different than that of America. European publications are very politicized, mm -hmm. um, very political, very political. Every um, Every, organ every paper has a different ideology, mm -hmm. um, unlike papers or news outlets here in the United States. And people aren't used to responding and communicating with the media as we as Americans are, you know, we're used to calling our media or writing a letter to the editor. Um, mm -hmm. Also, the American Jew, the European Jewish population does not tend to speak out as much as that of the American, as okay. American Jews. Um, they don't consider themselves first class citizens the way American Jews hmm. do. Well, uh, they might feel that they want to be a little quieter and, and not. Uh, you know, rock the boat type of thing in Europe more so than in America. Right, and they're also not as large per country. It, yeah, yeah. There's one other one other problem: the issue of incitement of Arab incitement and teaching hatred of Jews in the West in um, the Palestinian territories and all throughout the Arab world. This is often an underreported story. Many times, journalists are afraid their families will be will be victims of an assault if they mm -hmm. report on this issue. Also, reporters are afraid they'll be denied access to political leaders and good story leads. Hmm. Um, it, we must constantly alert the media to this issue. Wow. Uh, what are some of the biggest offenders, some of the notoriously worst uh, news organizations that you've come across? Um, well, we don't like to label outlets good or bad. That's. I mean, every organization has different reporters. Some are good or bad on a daily basis. Some reporters are always good. Other reporters are not you yeah. know, usually as good. But I'd say in the U.S., NPR, National Public Radio, has been a constant, consistent problem. Mm -hmm. um, while NPR has made 
NPR has made some has improved a little bit in that they put their they now correct um, make corrections and put their Middle East transcripts on the internet. Um, however, an NPR show often will have um, you know, an M NPR show often will give more airtime to Arab perspectives, or else they'll have an Arab on the show and a Jewish, per an Israeli on the show who's not mainstream and call that show balance. And this has been a constant problem at NPR. We're trying to rectify it, but you're making it's some progress. We're making, making some, some progress, but it's a constant, it's a constant battle.